one. Welcome back to another episode of AT Talks. We're still working with the Athletic Training and Athletic Training Student Guide. This is episode four. Um, I'm with the Brain Trust. Might have a couple members pop in here and there. They're busy with some sports on a Sunday. And uh, episode four, we're talking about policies and procedures and emergency action plans. So I'm just going to quickly start off. In 2018, I got hired in July. Uh, I started working in August at my high school. I walked into the athletic office and I said, hey, where's our emergency action plan? What's our policies and procedures? And they looked at me like I was speaking a different language. I go, okay, we don't have one. Well, that's not good. Let's get started. Uh, <laughs> so, so then we just have to go from there. Um, so let's assume that it's, um, it's a young AT, it's a fresh AT, first job, first school, maybe the first athletic trainer they've had, and they're working with nothing. So let's start. You want to start emergency action plan? Or you want to start policies and procedures, or just lump it together? So just lump it together because yeah. it, cause it all sort of go. It all works together. So just, just roll with it, baby. All right. So you're walking into work. You got nothing, and you need to put something together. Let's start from there. I mean, for me, I do think I agree with Mark. It all lumps together. If I was to pick one, what I would start with, it would be EAPs because I think the policy procedures is the ongoing you know, process. Uh, but I do think if we're going to be working and we're going to be working right away, you want to have at least your EAPs established. So everybody understands how to move forward in the emergency situation. Once that's established, then you can kind of continue to pan out the details. Um, so for me, um, definitely scanning the venues, you know, and I'm, and I'm not doing it by myself. If I can, I'm, I, I want to walk the venues with the AD. I want to walk the venues with if you have uh, police officers, if you have campus police and, you know, at the high school level, you know, your nurse, you know, you want to walk the venues with them. Um, you know, you want to have a template together and you want to have your questions out and you want to start answer, uh, getting some of those questions, you know, answered while you all are walking through that venue. Uh, so that's, you know, without trying to ramble on, that's that's in the in, in my mind on how we should start. I think one of the easiest things to make this um, seemingly enormous project a lot easier is don't reinvent the wheel. You know, it look for an example of, of somebody else nearby you. Um, if you're a very new to your, say, school district in a high school setting or, or college in a conference, um, talk to other people in your conference, talk to other people in your district, talk to other athletic trainers that have been there. Uh, or, or even people you know from uh, connections, I don't know, anywhere else you find to just ask around for examples. Um, sometimes in uh, athletic training education programs, that's part of a project, your policies and procedures, or your, your uh, O&A class will say, hey, you have to write this out, and heck, maybe pull that up, you know, you might have just, to, you know, done it kind of half-assed and turned it in for a grade, but that's a place to start. So, uh, it, it, for me personally, some of these seem like big, scary projects, like I really don't want to get this wrong, but it's, it's not nearly as intimidating if you don't have to start from scratch. So, you know, Google, uh, look around, ask around for other examples that you can then fine tune to your specific uh, location, your venues. I would agree, don't worry create the wheel. I think almost everybody does that project. And I think when I got my first job, I definitely went back to that project um, and just kind of went more in depth. You can Google, I agree, almost any policies and procedures um, for your level, whether it be a high school, whether it be collegiate to model off of. I think if you're going more in depth, my one piece of advice would be to look at the position statements, like the NATA position statements when we're talking about emergency action plans and make sure that you're at least covering those areas. So making sure that you have a heat illness policy within your EAP, um, lightning, other environmental conditions, kind of those things that have been mandated or highly suggested from the NATA to make sure that you're kind of covering your liability in those areas um, when you're building upon those kind of already pre-existing projects. Yeah, I was going to say exactly where Nikki went there. I was going to say NATA has position statements. We have the position statement on emergency action planning in athletics. And I'm looking for the name of the one. Oh, my God, I'm looking at the whole list. I'm just preventing sudden death in sports. Like, pull those two documents out. Start your planning based on that. Um, I've been teaching a class at UNLV, Emergency Management of Injuries and Illness. So this is, like, the first three weeks of class. We're talking about EAPs. And... Um, 
we use a book by Dr. Conan, Jeff Conan, and Dr. Rob Rayberg, and they, gave, they give an acronym, acronym in that book for creating an EAP, which is PREPARE. For PREPARE, you work with your personnel first, who's gonna be involved. You have to identify the players in the game that are gonna be working in an emergency situation. For the R, first R and prepare, the rules. What kind of standards do you plan to follow? What should everyone be doing? And sort of where does everyone fall in? Uh, the E equipment, what is it? What equipment do you have? Where is it located? And is it working? Is it working is kind of big one. You gotta kind of check it. And um, our buddy Dylan over there, he's been doing a big, he's been doing a big social media push with his EA, with his uh, AEDs all the time. Like, hey, make sure your AEDs are on, make sure they're working. Like I know in um, Las Vegas, we have to walk by our e AED every day. I'm getting my acronyms going crazy, the EAP and the AED and all of that stuff. And uh, it was getting wild today. <laughs> um, but I mean, I know we have to write our initials next to it saying we check to make sure the little box that says okay says okay. And if it doesn't, we got to get batteries for all that. But where it is, what it is, and is it working? Um, the, fir the first P planning. Um, that kind of takes into account the entire thing. Um, and is it being distributed to people? Is it being shared with people? Is it um, all encompassing? Uh, arena, one EAP per venue and per makeup of the venue. Like your wrestling gym is gonna look very different than your basketball gym. You need to make um, accommodations for that kind of stuff. In volleyball, you got the big old net in the middle of the thing. You gotta know where people are coming in and where people are coming out. Rehearsal. Rehearse, 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 practice, practice, practice. Um, I know the ATs in Vegas, every three months we go through a cardiac training scenario that we get signed off for by, uh, we work for select physical therapy. So we get signed off for that kind of stuff. Every year we do just basic emergency stuff because really like this needs to be our niche as ATs is emergency planning, especially when it comes to athletic stuff because this is our specialty. And to me, like this is where it goes. And that last year is evaluate. After you rehearse, evaluate how you rehearse. After you go through a situation, talk about it with the team that you went through it with and say, hey, what could we have done better? Because our job always comes back to customer service. If we do our job appropriately, our customer, our patient, our athlete has a good experience. And they're never having a good experience when they deal with us. So if we are evaluating what we're doing after we do it, I think that's super important to our job. And this is a topic that's like, this is the topic I pay attention to more than anything. Like this is my baby here. So I'll, I'll shut up for a little while. So about that. No, I, I love it. I love the uh, prepare acronym. Uh, that, that was smooth. It really was. I mean, cause it touched base on a lot of key components as you develop your emergency action plan. And uh, you know, one of the things to continue to emphasize <clears throat> is making sure you know who your personnel is. You know, um, obviously you're starting to get your emergency action plan. I kind of talked about walking around with the AD, walking around with the nurse and so forth. But sooner or later, you're going to have to reach out to your local EMTs, right? You know, uh, to make sure that we're all on the same board. You know, if they're going to be co coming up to your football games coming up, they need to know how the emergency action plan should work as well. So it's really important that sooner or later, you are reaching out to them to make sure that you are all on the same page. I think that's vital as we move forward. You know, you talk about equipment, you know, this is the next big point that I touch base on. Yes, you want to make sure all the equipment's working, uh, but you really want to make sure that you're convincing and making sure your staff, your administrators all on the same page on supporting you to ensure that you have all the emergency equipment necessary. You know, I think some schools really struggle, you know, uh, a principal gets an AED and that's it. But there's a lot of other emergency, you know, equipment components that I think is uh, important for us to have in regards to ensuring the safety of our student athletes. So, you know, if I, I, it can be a challenging road, depending on the budget of your school, but I think it's really important that you try your best to debate, argue, compel is the word that I really want to stand on in regards to making sure your administrators support you with the resources so that you can attain the appropriate emergency equipment. And one of the things I think that's so important that you just touched on is that you have to have your firefighters your slash EMT slash paramedics out at your schools just so they understand where everything is. Uh, if, I, if I'm if i new to the area or if I go to a neighboring school and or if I go to a Tony school and he goes, Walton, dude, come into um, door G and then you go upstairs and that's where the wrestling room is. Okay, well, first off, I don't know where door G is and I don't know where, where the stairs are at. And those are the same things your EMTs, paramedics, you're telling them on the, the dispatch person, hey, um, door F, 
walk into the gym. That's where the patient is, but they've never, they don't know where door F is. You're just wasting valuable time. And every second, every minute is super valuable in an emergency. So walk them out, walk them through. These are the doors. This is where this is. This is where this, this is how you get to the football field, the soccer field. Cause they just, they might not know. You say Southwest parking lot, that means something to you, but to them, they're like, there's six parking lots, which one Southwest. Yeah, when you're making the EAP and all that and like distributing that information to personnel on campus, you got to understand that part of your personnel, half your part of your personnel is on campus and part of the personnel is the people that are coming onto campus. Um, in Vegas, it's a little bigger city. So if I call 911, we might get four different ambulance crews from four different companies. So being able to rehearse with our EMS is kind of, it, it, it's a bit of a challenge. I don't know if Tony, I know you're in Georgia. Is it a smaller, do you get the same crew all the time that comes out to your place or how does that work? So for the most part, um, because Atlanta, Metro Atlanta is so big, we have so many different EMT companies. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, at least I know specifically for my community, we usually get the same uh, EMS or EMT crew. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a nice thing to do when you're in, you're in, uh, I'm in an urban setting. I mean, I've called EMS and had four different ambulance rigs come up to the place because it depends. There's Las Vegas city, there's Henderson, there's, um, Las Vegas County, and then there's the fire department. And that's, a, that's all. And then AMR or medic West might come do So, I mean, that, that's just all different different people that could be showing up. So it, it makes, in an ideal world, yes, had practice with the crew that would be in our town and do that stuff. In an urban setting, that might not be a realistic thing. Um, Tony, I wanted to ask you one question uh, about something you said earlier. You said walking around with the AED. This is a discussion we actually had in, in our city was they actually did not want AETs taking certain ADs out of their home like do you have an AD that's just for your athletic training room or do you have AEDs for the school because the reason this came up was we had a gym a AED and that used to be the one I would always take as, a, as an AT out to stuff because like, oh, I'm the athletic trainer there's a gym one but then the dis discussion came up what if there's an emergency on campus someone's looking for that gym one and I have it and they don't know where I'm at so then we started working on getting the one from the dean's office so that we're not affecting something that's in a common sports area. So, so I apologize. I was trying to say AD, oh. <laughs> not AD. But to to touch base on your point, though, uh, we do have uh, I we we actually had the same discussion. So we have ADs that are actually established at specific venues and will remain there at all times. Now, for athletic training, I do have two portable AEDs that I have the flexibility to uh, transition with at all times. Uh, but other than that, yeah, we have specific AEDs that are always located because whether it's during school, whether it's after school, uh, we need to make sure that when that, a, that, that EAP plan that's established on the wall, we need to make sure that that EAP plan can be uh, executed. So like you said, if I was to take that AED from the gym, but there is this after school practice, maybe from a junior club and there's an emergency situation and they run up to try to execute the uh, EAP and the AED is not there, yes, we are at fault. So I, I do agree with you and we have made sure and we were very fortunate at, the, at my school working with our nurse to compel our administrators the importance of having an AED, not just in specific venues, but to make sure that we can get to an AED within two minutes and back to the patient, okay, to provide care. And that was our biggest key point, you know, um, is to, to, to make sure that we can follow the standard of emergency care. That's a great point, Tony. And actually that, that just kind of reminded me of something I've been dealing with uh, at my specific site. Um, right now, at least in Illinois where I work, uh, there are no athletics, so there really is no pressure. But uh, earlier in the fall, I discovered that um, all of the AEDs in our athletic training room were going to uh, essentially just expire. They're, they're just too old. Um, so I started a project to research and uh, purchase new ones, maybe if there's a better model or, or you know, something that's better suited for where we are. Um, and I put together this proposal, and it's just kind of stalled in front of whoever the higher up is in charge of, of spending that money right now. And obviously I understand 
you know, spending money right now is, is going to be a little bit tight in a public school setting because they don't have any money coming in. But um, pretty soon, hopefully, ideally, we're going to start sports up again and we're going to have zero AEDs for all of our outdoor venues. Um, and I was mentioning it just before we started recording, but like we're going to have at least a dozen sports going possibly in the spring with zero AEDs outdoors. We have four inside the building, but Tony, that's a great point of, I need to be able to uh, persuade whoever's in charge of making that purchase that, that I'm not gonna have the ability to get that AED and get back to the patient within two minutes. I think that's a, that's a very good standard. Um, but yeah, even in, uh, in times like this right now where I, I really don't even go to work, um, I'm still thinking about those things still thinking about, okay, are my supplies where they, where they need to be? Um, are they ready to go? You know, those kind of things. And one of the things I'd recommend if you're at a school and there's no emergency action plan at all, um, just, just start small with your fall semester. Assuming you start in June, July, August, summer and fall, that's eight sports. That's four or five facilities. Knock that out. Don't look big picture, 21 sports, 10 facilities, because it's going to be very, very daunting. And um, you can get to that in the middle of the season or in that like three-day break between fall and winter season. Uh, that would just be my recommendation. Get the football field, get the soccer field, tennis courts, volleyball. But that's what we do in Indiana. I'm not worried about baseball. And, yeah, I'm not worried about baseball and softball in August, September, October, because those are March, April, May. So we can get there later. Same thing with uh, policies and procedures. Let's, let's show some love to policies and procedures. I would also recommend starting small with your basic, your weathers, um, what are you doing with doctor's notes, what are you doing with concussions, and then building that from there. I know some people have 10 pages worth of policies and procedures, and some people have 100 pages of policies and procedures. So what are the, what are the big ones to y'all that you, you have to have or that you should have and maybe we don't think about? Um, for me, I think... I think the biggest things, you know, for policy procedures, you know, is, you know, making sure you have your standing orders you know, established so, so people know exactly how you're supposed to be practicing as an athletic trainer. Uh, I think secondly for me, and I think there's a lot of important things for policy and procedures, but the thing that pops out to me the most is ensuring um, the importance of athletes and coaches and parents to make us aware of injuries. So understanding what that, uh, that process is. Uh, I think also the importance of injuries and so forth being documented, you know, so, you know, for us, we have what we call healthy roster. So coaches, just making sure they know, coaches can reach out to us through healthy roster. Parents can reach us through healthy roster, you know, so, uh, and, and just making sure they understand things or even, and this is my last little example, cause I, there's a lot of things for me to touch base on, but when it comes to injuries, you know, if an athlete goes sees a physician, what's that process? You know, medical documentation, right? We, I'm sure we all, I need to see medical documentation for our, you know, clear back on the field. But if that's not a part of your policy procedures, like if you come to a school and that was not the case, understand that you will have some challenges as you move forward as well, right? If you didn't have EAPs and policy procedures before you came to school and you're sitting here trying to tell your coaches, Hey, I need a I need a physician though before this kid plays, but that was not the case prior to you. You have to be realistic that you're about to fight a battle, a big battle. It's a good battle to fight, but you have to understand that there's going to be some challenges and you need to make sure that your administrators, especially your principal, is all in support of what you're trying to do uh, in, 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 in regards to the example that I just brought up. Yeah, for sure. Um, those are conversations that need to happen before it actually happens in real life. And that, and that, I mean, maybe that's some time when you're sitting down talking about your EAP stuff with you. Like if you sit down with your individual team and say, hey, this is what we need to do in an emergency. And here are certain things that, like, here, here's the big ones. We, we, they got to know what their concussion policy is and know what injury policy is. I mean, that, that's just sort of basic stuff. Um, policy and procedure manual for ATs in general, that depends on your hiring model too. We're, we're an outreach thing here. So our, our, our the company, I work for they provide us with a book that's this thick which is fine but it tells us 
how we have to act and what kind of manner we're supposed to be rolling in. Now, if you're um, direct through the school hire, you might have a little bit more leeway and that's something you should probably work with your, like Tony said, um, your admin is one, one A would be your team doc. Like they need to be up on that because they're probably working on those standing orders with you and probably saying, well, here, here's your standing orders. So sort of base it off of what we got going on there. And then, and you and anyone else that you have in your healthcare team, whether you got physical therapists involved, whether you got some nutritionists, whether you got some mental health um, resources, which don't forget about the mental health emergencies in the EAP and the policies and procedures, because that's stuff that we do need to think about and have some course of action for after school when counselors may be gone. Because that that's that, that's real life. I mean that that's just unfor it's it's unfortunate, but it's something that we need to be prepared for. I think one of the policies and procedures that I have modified the most and discussed the most and educated the most about is still the concussion policy. Um, and, and especially in an academic setting when you have student athletes and not just athletes or not just patients, you have the student aspect of it and you have to work in conjunction with uh, other healthcare professionals, maybe the school nurse, uh, school psychologists, um, guidance counselors, things like that. They should be in on your policy and procedure for concussions, um, also for mental health, of course, when they can, um, but, but absolutely concussion policy. Um, that's the one, I mean, I know it's, it's been a hot button issue for um, several years and, and we're really starting to um, learn a lot more. We have a, a much more comprehensive uh, picture of, of how to treat concussions in an academic setting with student athletes, um, but it's still the one I spend the most time on uh, in, in parent meetings. If I talk about any one policy or procedure, it's going to be concussions, you know, because um, I, I work in a, a secondary setting with minors, so their parents are very much involved. Uh, and they have to know beforehand, before they get into this, potentially, that this is how I'm going to treat a potential concussion. This is what you should expect um, so that there are no surprises, so that um, everybody's on the same page and, and the student athlete receives the best care. But um, to kind of go off of that, that communication of your policies and procedures, once you have these documents, the, the EAP and the policies and procedures, it's great. I mean, you should celebrate that you, you created something um, comprehensive and helpful and good, but make sure that one of the very next steps besides practice is to communicate it to uh, all the stakeholders. And I would even include people, especially your principal, even the school board. Um, if there's anything that happens to, uh, require any kind of uh, documentation or, or uh, I don't know, anything that might um, verge on any kind of uh, legal policies. Make sure that um, your school board knows, make sure that uh, if they want to, they, they can run it by um, school legal representation to, to make sure it matches with, uh, um, you know, other school-wide policies, um, just so that if something happens and you have this policy set in place and you followed it and it's great and it's best practice, but the school board or the principal or the administration uh, doesn't necessarily agree with it. Well, if they don't know about it, that's a bigger surprise than if they know about it. And then you can kind of, uh, you know, use that as an opportunity to educate those people too. So, you know, definitely create, celebrate your creation and then make sure everybody knows about it. I got to tell folks, and I think one of the big points that you made was you, you said the parent meeting, you just sort of brushed over that. If ATs aren't going to that preseason parents meeting, we're, we're doing a disservice to the kids and to the parents. Uh, you put a face to you because, I mean, I call parents when kids are hurt. N nobody wants to get, feel that phone call. They don't even know who you are, what you look like, what you do, what an athletic trainer is, none of that stuff. Like, the, like being at that parent meeting needs to be part of your policy procedures and um, being involved with those parents. Parents don't like surprises. No, no one wants to be like, oh, my kid has crutches. That's awesome. Oh, there's a random person. To, like they should know that you're there. They, they should know who you are and what's going on there. And, and, and going into that first year, you know, y'all talk about being in front of the parents. You talk about being in front of all the appropriate stakeholders. For me personally, I don't know how productive you can truly be in trying to get your policy procedures done within your first year, to be honest, if you're trying to be very thorough and comprehensive. I think that's something, yes, we should strive for. I think EAP should be established within that first year. Uh, but your policies and procedures, I think a lot of times you end up going to be just trying to communicate how 
things are going to be moving forward. But in regards to actually getting those documents completed, especially being at a high school by yourself, I mean, you're talking about just working through, you know, you know, through midnight all the time because you're spending most of your days trying to provide coverage and, and so forth. So in all honesty, you know, and this is even me working the college level and working with, you know, a full staff. It, it took several months when we all came in and we wanted to revise everything. It took several months to get that down. So knowing that you potentially may be working by yourself, I just want to relieve some stress that you might not be able to get the documents down right away, but just the communication that everybody's been talking about, you know, just sitting down with your administrators. Hey, I want to be able to move forward with this. Do you think that's okay? All right, well then go talk with your coaches and so forth. You might not have the document established, but at least it's been communicated and everybody's on board that this is how we're going to address things. And then hopefully sooner or later, you can get it on hard copy. You can get it signed off and, you know, and be good. Uh, but I think sometimes even when papers aren't completed, just having those talks, being able to come to agreement allows people to move forward a lot, you know, a lot better. I would just emphasize that again, the communicating. I will say probably one of the biggest, I don't want to say regrets, but things, situations I could look back on and wish I would have changed when it came down to a policies and procedures issue when I was in the high school. So I had communicated my policies and procedures and my emergency action plan with my AD, um, but she did not communicate that to the principal. And even though in our model, the principal isn't directly a supervisor, if you would say, they're still a very important part of the school. So one of the assistant principals over athletics was in my emergency action plan as the person who was designated to travel with an athlete um, to the hospital if we are out at an out of town game. So we were out of town, that person was designated in my emergency action plan to do so, but then when I tried to get them to do so, we ran into conflict because it hadn't made it that far up the chain of that person's responsibility to do so. And it just so happened that they had done it before, so they kind of got into like a, I did it last time, I don't want to do it again. Um, and it kind of became an issue. I was very thankful that I did have it down on paper um, in a written format because that did allow me to refer back to a paper document that had been signed by my AD. Um, but that was one of my biggest things learning that. That was my first year working. I had written it. I thought I had everything check boxed in place, but I would say make sure you're aware of your chain of command um, beyond your direct supervisor. And then just make sure all of those stakeholders are aware of the plan and then aware of what's in the plan and then also that they agree what what's in the plan right they may have kind of read over it or skimmed over it but it's a very important document with lots of moving parts in it right um, and you're going to update that from year to year so i would just say make sure that the very important elements of that specifically people who are included with that have agreed to and are willing to do what it takes you know in those circumstances to fill it up and understand that it's a to me, it's a very fluid document that's, it's always going to be evolving and something can happen. You can say, what does the uh, PMP say? And you go, oh, we don't have a policy on that. Make one. Or you could have something happen. You're like, I didn't like how that happened. We need to modify this. Um, I would just start, start with the, the biggest things. Hey, when are you going to provide care? Cool. These are my boundaries of care. I'm going to be here from two to eight, Monday through Friday. So if you want to have that nine o'clock practice, that's on you, coach. Uh, concussions, heat, lightning, uh, concussion, not only return to play, but return to learn. Um, just like bigger things like that. And then you can flush out the little things like um, in Indiana, air quality, not a real big issue. But for Mark in Nevada with fires in California and such, not air quality, have it in there. Yeah, the, the fire smoke blows over the mountain. That's no fun down here when they get when they got it going crazy in SoCal. And I, I, I know having gone to school at San Diego State, I know we've had days off because of brush fires when I was at school. Like that was something that they had to put in their policies um, at that place. So um, that yeah, it, it's a living, breathing document. It's something that's going to change. We didn't have an emergency plan for the random person that was going having a mental emergency or ran into the school painting themselves and started doing jumping jacks in the middle of volleyball practice. But we kind of do now. Now we know where to put the kids in a situation. Like, like stuff just happens. You can't plan for everything. And that's something you got to get. Like when you're doing EAP stuff, policy procedure stuff, you do kind of got a little get a little crazy and be like, hey, what, what kind of stuff could potentially happen? You'll always get surprised, though. You will always get surprised. Um, 
we, we just got to sort of be prepped for it. And when visiting teams come over, we have to prep them with what's going on at our school too. provide them with some kind of information, bare minimum. I mean, let's say you're the only person at your school and there's four fields going on at once. You got a visiting team. They should have the address of the school. So it, because, I mean, just think of the stuff that 911 asks you, who are you? Where are you? What went on? So the, I mean, if you're a visiting coach, you don't know what, the addresses at the school that you're at and maybe the admins, there's only one admin working all and they're walking around too. So they might not have that info really quick. So, and we need to be making sure we're providing that info to the visiting coaches. We need to introduce ourselves to the visiting coaches. If you can ideally get a medical timeout, which I know Tony's really big on the medical timeout. He posts, Hey, you know what? As you should be, as we all should be like Tony is always posting pictures of that during football season with the Walton sports med crew. And I, I love when you do that. I share that every time I see that stuff, because that, that that's just stuff that needs to be second nature for us. Every visiting coach should know who you are when they walk onto your campus. Um, they should know where your campus is. They should have your contact info just in case they want to get a hold of you for something, because I mean, that's what we're there for. We're there for emergencies and we, we need, that, that has to be our niche and that has to be what we are, what we do better than anyone else. And we have to be the best at that. You brought something up to me and I just thought about it because we recently went over ours is a, po a coverage policy. I think it's huge when you're at the high school or at any setting where you physically can't be at all the venues at one time. I think it's really important to have a specific policy about who takes priority when it comes to on-field coverage so that people, again, people know where you're at, they know where to find you in case you're not at cheerleading practice, they're gonna know that you're covering men's soccer or whatnot and a kind of a who goes where, especially given if you have multiple staff members, if you're lucky enough to have multiple staff members, knowing who's gonna go where, I think is a very important policy as well. Yeah, you, have, you absolutely have, if you're not talking to the away coaches, if you're not talking to referees, uh, <laughs> you need to reflect on your practices because that's not good. Um, but also a little fun fact that I didn't know until my second year is that if you have police officers that come to games, talk to those police officers before the games, go over the emergency action plan with them, ask them, Hey, if, if we have an emergency and I make an X on the field, will you radio an ambulance? Yes, I will. I have yet to have a police officer say no. And they, they know a lot of the information. They know where to go. Um, they have first access. Boom. Get the gates open. The doors open. Here comes that ambulance. Um, so definitely reach out to your police. Reach out to the refs. Reach out to the away people. We're going to get kicked out any second. So thank you for coming on. We could talk about this for like another hour. Like we're just getting do stuff now. Like just getting excited, you know. Um, I mean, start start small and, and work on it. Um, hopefully, you, hopefully something's already there. Hopefully you're not alone, but if you are, you just got to take it one day at a time and get something down. Because if it's not down and you go to fight um, and you can't, it's, it's not written down, it's going to be a huge battle, as Tony always says. If you go to football in August,